I don't even know what that's uh, about. Uh, uh, an army of normal folks. It's doing well. Yeah, the podcast. I mean, it's, it's been as high as number 10 in the country on Apple. So uh, are you still doing anything football? Uh, well, I did up until COVID. And then COVID shut me out, and I hadn't got back in it. I miss it. But you do? I, yeah, and the year after COVID was especially difficult for my business. I'm mm. in the lumber business. Yep. And I'm like, I have no business taking off for, you know, nine months and going to coach football, so I didn't. But I will because I miss it. You it's, miss it. It's still my passion. But And then this thing came up, and, you know, I mean – like you said, it only released six weeks ago, but it's doing well. All right, so how did this come about? I, you know, I was running my mouth like I do, and um, after my book came out, I was did a bunch of interviews, and then that led to me more speeches, and something happened. I, I don't remember what happened, but it was on the news cycle, and I watched CNN and Fox. And then I listened to C-SPAN and listened to Republicans and Democrats both talk about this thing that happened. I really don't remember what it was, whatever happened. It was like we lived in four different planets, mm -hmm. the way people were describing what happened. And I was particularly irritated um, that, you know, our press and our, our politics are so divided that we've gotten to this place that says if you don't look like me think like me talk like me act like me worship like me or vote like me you must be my enemy and i think that's destructive and i think over the last couple of decades in our country that's been what continues to, to divide us into these little chambers that we end up categorizing ourselves in and so i was being interviewed and of course the guy asked me you know what do you think we need to do to fix it the proverbial it. And I said, uh, you know, there's neighborhoods in Memphis and every urban city in the country that you drive by that you just don't want your car to break down in. That's not where you want to have a flat tire. And when you cruise past it, you look down that street or you kind of look over the viaduct as you pass by and you, and you see the, the desperation, the poverty, the despair, the disenfranchisement. You think to yourself, you know, somebody ought to do something about that one day, as if your empty sentiment matters. And it just doesn't. And I think maybe we had to cock that rearview mirror about 15 degrees to the left. And we'll see who somebody is, because government's proven woefully inadequate. The fancy people on Fox and CNN aren't fixing anything. And, and candidly, I think they're incented by amazing amounts of power and wealth to continue to put narr narratives out that do divide us. So not only are they not fixing it, I think they're incented to not fix it. And I, I think it's going to take just an army of normal folks, just people like you and me, despite family troubles, spouse troubles, financial troubles, and every other trouble normal people have, to just see an, a, a place of need in their corner of the woods and employ their discipline, employ their skills in a passionate way to fix little bits of the world and if we had a, a literal army of normal folks, despite who you are, where you come from, or where you look like, across this country, doing things in their community to make things better, that we don't need the narrative out of the national news anymore. And we can dismiss the politicians that are actually incented to divide us. And I don't care who you are, what you look like, or what you think. I can celebrate you if you're doing something good for another person in the community, and you can celebrate me. And so that's at least one common denominator that is one thing that, regardless of who you are, um, that we can all celebrate. And, I, and so I said that on this interview, and I didn't think about it anymore. And then seven months later, the uh, Iron Light Labs, this guy named Alex Cortez, who's a producer with Iron Light Labs in Chicago, calls up and says, hey, man. I can't get off my mind what you said to me in that interview. And I was like, oh, crap. What did I, I mean, I cussed. What did I, you know, yeah. what did I do? All right. Right. And then he reminded me and he said, do you really feel that way? I said, yeah, I think it's common sense, which is kind of who I am. And yeah, I think and he said, well, I want to start a podcast called An Army of Normal Folks. We'll go find normal people doing amazing things all over the country. You interview them, just be you, talk to them, which, you know, I don't know any other way to do that. And, 
we'll create these episodes and they're going to be interesting and redemptive and hopefully entertaining and people laugh, people cry and all that. But also we're going to give everybody's personal number. We're going to give everybody's personal contact information. You're going to give yours. So as people listen, we grow a community of people inspired by these stories that if you listen long enough, you're going to hear a story about something that you do have a talent for and that you are passionate about. And you're going to have the contact information and name of someone who's done that as well as ours. And we'll support you doing that in your own neck of the woods. And over time, literally not only have a podcast that's entertaining, but grow a community, an army of normal folks celebrating one another's work in and around their communities. And if we grew big enough, we could tell the people in D.C. and uh, New York to kiss our ass. So that you grow this community. This is a noble pursuit, right? That yeah, if you can, a, a literal right, movement. That, it, because it, as, it, as it starts to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, then all of a sudden you've got what becomes our podcast fans, but they all feel this interconnection. That's right. the hope. Yes. yes. Because, listen, you and I may not vote alike. Mm-hmm. We may not worship alike. We may not think the same thing about pick a problem, crime in Memphis. Mm-hmm. We, we may not think that our DA is doing a good job letting some of these smaller criminals out and not posting bail. Or we may think he's doing a great job because that's the way to do it. We can argue criminal justice to a blue in the face. We can argue whether there's a God or not, till we're blue in the face. And I have strong feelings about that, and so does everybody else about all those issues. And, and we need to start having those conversations, but in a civil, non-threatening way so we can learn about one another and quit dividing over these issues and start respecting them. But there is one issue that none of us can fight over that we can all celebrate in unison regardless of our ethos and who we are. And that is if you are taking your talents to do something significant in your community to help other people, I don't care what you think. I don't care how you vote or what you believe. I'm just appreciative of your work and I'm gonna support you and you can support me. And And if we can gather around something that binds us together, which is our humanity, maybe we can change this it thing that's dividing us across this country. It's fascinating because I think I, I speak for Rosa as well. The reason we've done this for so long and the reason we've loved it so much is because that's sports. That's what I do. You know what I mean? I don't get into, I don't, you know what I mean? I don't get you into, get into all, it. You know, I, and I follow a lot of our listeners and people that we have on and our guests, and I feel wildly different about many things than them. It doesn't matter. We all like the Grizzlies. We all, we all like SEC football. Yeah. We all like, like, so it has been, sports has always been the common ground for me and everyone. Like, you know what I mean? The, like, there's no reason to, I, I don't hate you. You don't have to hate me. Like, we all have this in common. You walk into an arena. It's all these fans. You see people high-fiving each other when John Moran hits a three or whatever. They don't ask each other who they voted for or what they, like, you know what I mean? It's people being people because it's something that brings them together. And I think this is, in this way, the same deal, right? Which is something... Sports, to me, has always been something we can all agree on, right? Like, yeah, we're going to fight about the sport, right? Or who's playing or who's not playing or this coach is a dummy or this coach is a wizard or whatever. But, like, all that other stuff gets set aside, you know what I mean, in terms of what we're talking about. People don't sit there and evaluate your opinion on sports based upon what you feel about some kind of socioeconomic policy. People my age will remember that the only game in town used to be the Memphis State Tigers. Right. And the Memphis State Tigers in the 70s and 80s were the one thing that it didn't matter what you look like, who you are, whatever, we celebrated those guys. And wrestling. And right. <laughs> well, I don't know. You know it didn't matter. Were you a Jimmy Valiant or a Jerry yeah, Lawler yeah, guy? Right. You know, were you a Bill Dundee or a, yeah? But, but you're right. Wrestling on Monday night was the was a thing. But the, you know, people got to remember April fourth, nineteen sixty eight. Martin Luther King was shot and killed in this city, about seven blocks south mm-hmm. of here, and it tore our culture up in this. It tore the the world, but in Memphis, it was obviously poignant. All right. And along come the Memphis State Tigers and start winning some games and stuff. And, and, and that was a point of healing for our city. 
Sports. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sports. And when you went in the Mid-South Coliseum or watched the replay on WKNO back in those days, man, it didn't matter what you thought or who you came from. Yeah. We were all around that. And, and, and on a national level, you know, the things that have brought us together have always been tragedy. That's right. Wars, 9-11, Pearl Harbor, uh, things like that. And, you know. Oh, Bill, dude, I came on this pod and I said, I hope that's what happens with this virus. And the exact opposite happened. We it's don't. Ne- it was like nothing in my lifetime. We should not have to have a tragedy to have a rallying cry. That's right. To have something to, to come around. We can celebrate one another's differences. We can be a forward thinking evolving society without abandoning the core principles that defined us in the first place. We can be all of that. And I don't see why that defining principle can't be the service of humanity in this country Mm -hmm. and celebrating people involved in it and giving people all kinds of different ways to engage in that. And that's the platform of an army of normal folks. So many of our listeners are going to know you from the very famous movie that ended up winning the Academy Award, Undefeated. For those of you that have not watched it, uh, I would encourage you, go watch the movie, because it's incredible. And there are all manner of stories that take place within that movie. And one of the podcast episodes, the first one uh, that I clicked on when I heard that you had a podcast coming out, was the one that you did with Chavis Daniels, who is a Which character... Was- Unbelievably difficult for me to do. Which is an unbelievable podcast for any Memphian. I would encourage you to go listen to this because this is one of ours um, in Chavis Daniels. Uh, born and raised in Memphis, now in Memphis. And if I'm just, I, I'd just be totally upfront. If there was, at one point in the podcast, you guys mentioned that even from that movie, there are, I believe there's six that have passed away. There's seven that are in jail from that Manassas team way back when. And that is the, the culture of North Memphis and the statistics that you give within the context of the podcast are unbelievable. But if in in, just watching the movie, Chavis would have been the one in the movie that would have been defined as most troubled. He's the one with his, pants around his ankles that's trying to fight money in a team meeting. He's the one that had already been in a gang at the time he's 14 and been sent off to juvie for uh, 15 months. And you got him to talk about that, which he never talks about, right? He doesn't. He rarely talks about that. Right. And so, and if there, if I were a betting man and you would have told me at the beginning, like, hey, whatever happened to those guys, I think anybody that watched the movie would have thought Chavis probably... As soon as as soon as, the, as soon as this structure is gone, that kid's got a bad temper, and he did in the movie. I mean, you know, the Bolivar game, he gets suspended. I mean, the, the kid had real anger issues, and 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 you saw it all. And there are some very sweet moments, right, where he stands up in front of everybody as the uncommon man. I remember in the movie and whatever. But Chavis is the one I would have been most worried about. How's that story end? And then I saw that you had recorded a podcast with him and to tune that in and to hear him tell his story as an adult now i was like damn oh, crazy isn't it crazy so if you can just explain to people even for those that have not seen the movie this this character that became chavis daniels and now this man that is chavis daniels well the reason i said it was hard for me to do is because i'm so i want to say proud of him which I am. I'm incredibly proud of him, but I, I don't want to come off um, even paternalistic in saying that. I am proud of him, but more importantly, I'm inspired by him. I'm, I'm awed by him. Um, he, he's, a, he's a kid that was in a gang, I think at 13, actually, and who did go to and he jail. names it he says i was in the rolling crypt 20s that's right it's what he was in like he it, 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 he and, calls it out yes and, and this is what i was doing and this is who i was and with this is and, what i was involved in yep. and i went to vanassas played football for coach bill and like on week five 
as a freshman, the guy had nine or ten tackles, and I was, like, fired up. I was actually going to move him to a more important position on the defense. And Monday, I didn't see him anymore for 15 months. And um, he got locked up. And it, all jail taught him to do was be more violent, more angry. And, you know, I, I inherit now a much larger Chavis Daniels. His well, a quick timeout. He, in Juvenile, which is in Whiteville, Tennessee, right. he explains what that's like even on your podcast yeah, he, and it, says, it, you, he basically, if you're not in a gang there, you're beat. You're dead. You're dead. You're so in trouble. You've got, so it's not like it separates you from being in the gang. In oh, fact, it encourages it's, you even more. It's the very opposite. It doesn't separate you. It grips you more. Right. And then, of course, when you get out with very little prospects, it's what you have, and so it's where you migrate, which explains the 75% recidivism rate in the United States. 75% of everybody that comes out of jail is back in jail within 30 months, and that's why. Uh, you just become more indoctrinated in jail. And so he came to us. as I didn't know any of that back when I was coaching. Um, I just knew he was in jail, and he came out, and, you know, it was a really difficult time getting his rear end back between the curbs and you can watch the movie and find out how that ends up but then you know that's great when you when you're 17 and 18 you got a coach and a community a school community around you and embracing you but a lot of these kids when they graduate high school haven't taken care of their grades haven't really had the culture or the sport around them and so they go from bright-eyed 17-year-old having a good time a senior in high school to really scared 18-year-olds. Now, they're not, they're, they're not going to show that because they put on this bravado facade, but inside them, their head's spinning like, oh, what the hell do I do now? You know? And I thought for sure that Chavis would succumb to some of those pressures. I did know he had a lot of growth, but at any rate... You mentioned um, on the pod, just for point of reference, I was blown away and this was a uh, oasis of hope which is hope presbyterian does right. all manner of outreach work you had a statistic on there that i, I mean i i almost stopped my car yeah that, i mean that it was three times a 21 year old in north memphis is three times more likely to be dead or in prison than to have a job right that's right that's i was like to have a job uh, like, just a job yeah that's true now don't let that get outside of you. Or you could just be not in jail or dead, but also not have a job. Right. Right. Just hanging around. I right. mean, but the thing is, that's true. And and this is where he was. This, Yeah. I mean, 1.3% of the people in that area have a college degree. Fewer than 40% own their own home. Fewer than 40% have a car. And... Um, uh, 78, 87% of the kids in high school named the grandmother as the head of the household. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's not good. And that's where he came from. And now, you know, he gets on our podcast. Obviously, I invited him because I knew what he'd done. But in an army of normal folks, it's hard. I, obviously, going back to what I said, I want to inspire normal people with normal problems to get involved. Well, when you hear somebody in a podcast, you have to understand to be inspired by them, you have to identify with them. So the first part of the podcast is just exploring with each guest who they are, where they come from, to identify them as, oh, they're just normal people. They just came from normal circumstances and happened to do something extraordinary, not because they were queefed or not because they were tabbed or not because they're part of some NGO or big government organization. They don't do things because they're wonderful people. They do things despite their difficulties, right? And so that's what we, so, you know, we got into the podcast. I didn't know how far Chavis would go with it, but I said, hey man, tell us about you, where you come from and who you are. And he opened up and it even made the podcast more impactful because as you think about what he's doing, done and currently doing in our city, um, this cat has overcome a lot of not only personal demons, but societal demons. And, and he's done that. And, and if you listen to that podcast and you don't think, 
well, for God's sakes, if Chavis Daniels can do something I can, then I, I, you don't need to be listening to the podcast because the, I don't even know how to reach you. The reason it was so impactful for me is because, I, and I think for anybody that has seen the movie, is because it's not one of those like, oh, here's this story and look at what he's overcome and whatever else. Like, I felt like I knew who that kid was because of that movie. Like there was a, here's an, like I see how that kid acts. I see him getting in that fight in that team meeting. I see him, you know, and it's like, so there's a, there was a visual and it felt like you knew, you know, you're invested in these you, people you, you, and these characters in some way. And it's like, it's not just the story you're telling and I can't relate to it because I saw that kid at 15, 16, 17 on screen. And you now know, you and hear what him on the podcast like. as a 29-year-old father and what he's doing. It's I mean, crazy. Joe, besides what he's doing with the North Memphis So, yeah, explain, explain what he's well, doing oh, Well, he, he decided that um, North Memphis didn't have really a, a program for kids, and he started the, it's a mouthful, the North Memphis Steelers Youth and Mentoring Program, and he started with a, 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 a little football team of, uh, I think, eight, eight-year-olds at that time. And in two years, it grew to teams for five different ages with cheerleaders for five different <laughs> ages, which is funny. And but then it's more kids involved. And more, that's what he was doing. And every on the back of every jersey and on every uniform is the term school first. He checks all of their report cards. And if they're not don't have good grades, and I don't know if he cuts that off at a C plus or C minus or whatever, but if they don't, they are still required to come to practice and be involved in everything. They just can't play in games until their grades are up. So he's actually holding youth league kids accountable to their school. They break with school first. And he's taken five or six teams to the national championships <laughs> right here in Memphis. He's got some ballers running around. And he did it with no money. He went out and begged and borrowed and stealed and leveraged what little bit of people know about him. And these kids are running around in brand new uniforms, unbelievable equipment. They're known, and and it's the North Memphis Steelers youth. And I, I've been to two of his end of the year awards banquets, and the kids are in ties. Um, uh, he he makes them get up on stage and present themselves well. They sit together. They don't screw around. He keeps them right. And, and he sets these kids up to, to see a way of doing things that are positive and be part of something to be proud of. And then, on top of it, now he started this thing called We Not Me TV, where he goes around, he's tired. He's, he had freely admits on the podcast there's a lot going on in the inner city that isn't right. But there's a lot going on that people don't know about because the press doesn't tell you about it. And he's going around recording people in the inner city doing positive things and telling their story and calling it We Not Me TV. And, I mean, he's had 100,000 followers on a couple of them. And he's, the kid is the kid. He's a young man now. He is eaten up with trying to create positivity and share positivity about the inner city to change the people's perception of it and in it. Yeah, and when he even, there's a very powerful moment where he says to you, the hardest part for me is, and the term he says is because he says, coaching the me out of them. Yeah, when he said that, I almost cried. He said, the hardest thing for me is I got to coach the me out of these kids, meaning the old him. He sees himself. Yeah, but... Who better to recognize what that looks like? I was him? you. Right. I, I experienced this when we did we did things with Jif. Uh, um, we used to do a Tony Allen karaoke night with Jif, and Tony would get up there and tell his story, and then you would hear these kids that were in the program tell their stories, and you'd just be absolutely just it's, blown it's, away. But those kids, they see, they saw Tony, and they related to him. He could speak their language. He, he was them. He was them. He did get in the trouble. He was running around with the wrong crowd. He did have a friend that came and picked him up to make sure he went to school every day, right, and go to practice every day and did have coaches that looked after him. And so, you know, or else he knows. 
you know, because a lot of his buddies went down the wrong way. Who better to coach the Chavis out of kids from North Memphis than the guy who recognizes it better than anybody else, which is Chavis. But for him to have that insight and to speak that is what was just, you know, leveling for me. Um, Would you have ever imagined in a million years? That Chavis would do that? Yes. As you know, if you watch the movie, he did plenty many times to just get kicked off a normal high school football team. And we never did. And the reason was. He was too good. I'm kidding. Well, you got to understand. The, the move, <laughs> he was a hell of a player. He was a hell of a player. He's but a that, hell of a player. Went, but that really wasn't it. The, the, what was it was. <laughs> well, let's be was fair. Good. A sorry kid would have been well, I also off. benched him six weeks. So even though he wasn't a hell of a player, he didn't get to play. But what. Yeah, but. I'm telling you what you got to remember undefeated is an hour and 50 minute movie that's supposed to chronicle an entire season. That's the pinnacle of a seven year stay at Manassas. Right. So you don't get all the backstory. Right. When it was just me and Chavis and no cameras and nobody else, he revealed to me a softness and a decency that, um, was legitimate and it's why I never gave up on him it's why I never wanted to kick him out of the program because I knew deep inside there underneath all the bravado the gangs the tr- the the trauma that that he got in jail was a true decency and kindness that was real and so am I did I ever imagine he would do what he's doing now no who could have imagined it I mean that was his passion and his idea he dreamed that up but did I have a sense that he could go on to do some amazing stuff because of who he was? I actually really did believe in him that much. Um, but what he's doing for kids is phenomenal. And, and I got to tell you, you know, I love that you listen to that podcast, but that episode, and I, I mean, we're only seven weeks old, so we only got seven um, stories out there. The the eighth gets released tomorrow. But I'm going to tell you, that is what happens when you interview normal folks. Is the the stories you 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 know Ben Affleck's story. You mm-hmm. know whoever's story. Pick a pick a person, right? You know John Morant's story. I mean, it's all mm-hmm. over the place. But every, there's a story under every helmet, you know. And when you when you when you hear some person you don't know much about, but there's some miraculous thing they've done. Well, there has to be an enormous amount of depth behind them to have done that in the first place. Mm -hmm. And the discovery of that through a normal lens and a conversation is always shocking. I can't, I, I have not done an interview yet that I haven't sat there and thought to myself, wow, where are you finding the people to highlight? Well, the, 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 Iron Light Labs out of Chicago is the producer, and so they find all the people, and then they give me, uh, you know, a list of potential guests for the show, and I more times than not say yes, but it's yes, no, yes, no, and probably 90% yes, and they find them all over the place. And, I mean, we're talking about, look, dude, episode two is a, is a girl named Ann, grew up in North Dakota, her father gambled away. His father's an addict, gambled away all of their money. She got bulimic, and she was, she was really, really talented in school and an and, and athlete, but she was dealing with all kinds of family trauma and, and, and identity issues with led to bulimia, and her, her um, cheap therapy was running. And she got a job in Philly, and was running six miles a day, rain, shine, cold, hot. That's the only thing she could do. And she would, like, eat herself to death and then throw up and then go run seven miles. And she was running past this homeless shelter every day and always noticed the guys on the porch. And one time the guys on the porch said, hey, is all you do is run around here all day? And she said, is all you do is sit on your ass all day? And kept running. And she couldn't quit thinking about him because she thought, you know, that could be my dad. My addict dad, who gambled everything away, he could be homeless on a porch. And she went by the next day, went up to the executive director and said, you know what, I'm going to start a running club. 
And the next secretary, well, the homeless don't run. No way, what do you, you start a, a <laughs> marathon club for a bunch of dudes in a homeless shelter? These guys aren't running. And she said, give me a chance. And he said, okay. And seven shined up. And today, Back on My Feet is the name of the organization that started from this normal kid with all these problems, starting a running club for seven guys in Philadelphia. And 7,500 former homeless people now have full-time jobs and housing that they pay for on their own with not one dollar of government money, all because she believed. What? She believed if you could teach people the discipline of getting up and starting to run every day on time, the one thing you can't cheat life on is a run. You got to keep plodding. And she started this running club with seven people, and now 7,500 people from this thing called Back on My Feet is in 15 different cities, and 7,500 former homeless people in seven years are now housed and have full-time jobs as a result of the discipline and the tenets and the fundamentals they learned from just running. And she happened to be a good runner and was passionate about it, and she did it. That is That's, insane. Okay, every single episode is the stories, but the first hour of that episode is her talking about when she was six years old and wanting a white picket fence in the normal Rockwell world and her dad blowing up her life and her getting bulimia and traveling all over the country trying to find happiness. And you find out, oh, she's a normal person. All kinds of issues and everything. She didn't do back on my feet because she's an amazing person. She did it despite the fact that she was struggling but was still able to exact. Now, let me ask something. If you're Jewish, Christian, agnostic, black, white, Hispanic, Latino, gay, straight, Republican, Democrat, does that story bother any of those categories? All right. No. In fact, everybody in those lists can celebrate that story. That's how we create an army of normal folks who can change the direction and narrative of this country. We do not have to be divided by our differences. We can actually come together with them. It's an incredible story. Uh, And these are now, how often are the episodes going to come out? So um, we're distributed by iHeart. And you will inevitably do an episode. You know this, right? Like, I mean, you're now, now you're going to be a movie magnet because they, you know, it's like, hey, Bill Courtney from Undefeated, right? I don't, know. I don't know about No, no, no. So, somebody's going to hear these stories and try to make a movie at like, Yep, maybe. That one? That's a great story. It's a movie. You haven't even. That is a movie. It is. Man, it's a I, movie. If we had. I, well, what am I saying? Just listen to the damn podcast. <laughs> You'll know the story. Um, wait till you hear John Ponder's story. But um, uh, what, what you asked me? Where was I going? The episodes. You, how often? Oh, so uh, iHeart is our distributor, and they like 30 to 40 minute podcasts because. You can listen to them to and from work or on your morning run or on the treadmill or whatever. But each episode is between an hour and a half and two hours long. So each episode has three or four parts. Right. We release all of them on Tuesday. So you can sit there and listen to two hours at once, or you can listen to part one on Tuesday, part two on Wednesday. That by the time the week ends, you come back around and it's another episode. So they're released on Tuesdays. Once a week. Once a week. With three or four parts per episode, so you got those spread out through the week. Occasionally, we do a, I did a Father's Day special episode for eight minutes. It was me talking about Father's Day and my fatherlessness. We also, inside the podcast, have an occasional episode called Supporting Greatness, where we talk to somebody who's done something great, but we really don't talk about what they've done great, because you already know what we talk about is the three or four people in their life that were normal folks that taught them things to support them to achieve greatness. So like I interviewed Mike Rowe yesterday from Dirty Jobs, and we talked about his scoutmaster, his music teacher, and his grandfather, who were the most, the three most inspirational people in his life. And we talked about how normal they were, but what he learned from them and how they supported him. And so we release uh, every Tuesday and then an occasional you know, special episode of supporting greatness or a special episode of something that's like a verbal blog that I do. And like I said, man, we've, we've been out, we, we've been as high as number 10 in the country on Apple. It's incredible. It's ridiculous. It's incredible. It's stupid. No, but it speaks to avoid. It, it's, it's not me. It speaks to the guests. Well, and people don't and want to, like, people want something to latch on to. They do. Like, they do. 
you know, I know there that obviously look the ratings of for these TV news is will tell you what what sells and what gets ratings and people do want to hear about Hunter Biden's laptop or whatever. But like it, it, no one is talking about that. Well, if he, you he, go to a football game Friday night, you're not sitting around going, hey, what do you think about <laughs> how many <laughs> how many people on Fox and CNN that are talking heads have read Hunter Biden's laptop. I mean, who cares? None of them. No, the point is, I just the, the point is, we're getting divided right over by a bunch of people yeah. who are talking about stuff they've heard that yes. most of all they mostly don't know anything about, but they're incented by money and power to continue to draw them in. Listen, I know you don't want to get into all this sports show, but I, I got to say this to you: Pew Research. All right. I wrote a, uh, I don't know, I wrote a, a op-ed that was in, I don't know, U.S. I, it was in something. But I did a little research on it. And Pew Research is, had one of the most interesting things in the world. So we got a 39% approval rating of Congress. No, of presidency. We got a 19% approval rating of Congress. For the first time in the history, we got less than a 50% approval rating of the Supreme Court. And 69% of the people in the country believe that any news media they're fed from the national news media is slanted, mm -hmm. meaning they don't trust it. In the same Pew Research, 75% of the people that responded said they spend at least two hours a day either listening to the news, listening to the news stations, watching news, watching news stations, or reading social media. So here's the thing. We don't believe anything we're being told by the media or by the politicians, yet we inundate ourselves with the crap we don't believe. Right. What a bunch of sheep we are. <laughs> what the... F are you kidding me? If you don't buy it and don't believe it, but you are addicted to the input that's already screwing your mind up, maybe there is something wrong. No. And here's what's wrong. We need to quit with that stuff. We need to celebrate the things that we can celebrate and quit being divided by these narratives. And I truly believe it's going to take an army of normal folks finally saying enough's enough. Let's find something we can celebrate. And we're giving the stories that you can celebrate, trying to join people in a community that is not divisive, but is challenging and interesting and redemptive and all that. Last thing. What episode comes out tomorrow? Next one comes out tomorrow. No, what is it? I can't tell you. You got to listen. What are you talking about? You can't tell me. I'd, I'd tell you if I Just knew. Just tease me. You don't know which one? I don't How know which one. You've already recorded all of them. Uh, no. Uh, we, we, when we released seven weeks ago, we had 20 of them done. What? Right. You had 20 in the can before you ever even dropped can, this thing? 20 can. Wow. And uh, and that gave us a, a we got to do fifty two of these things right <laughs> so this year so we had to, I got a job I got a business to run I got other stuff going on I ain't just running around yeah, doing right. a five right so twenty of them and then we're and then so we're doing uh, you know one here one there but I honestly don't know which one iHeart has edited and will release tomorrow um, I'll listen with you it'll be great oh that's great I, I, I forgive me actually one more thing. So the movie is still on streaming. Yeah, it's and on people, Netflix I'm and saying people, Amazon Prime. People catch it all the time. Well, and I, they're catching it more now because of this thing, because people are getting reintroduced to it. So now they catch the movie. What, when is the last time someone, you know, of note came to you that had just seen the movie? You know what I'm saying? Like somebody, there are people out there that are watching this thing like now, and they're like, oh, I got to find that guy. Right? It happens I'm all sure the time. it happens all the time, it right? Does. Where it's like, oh, I got to find Coach Bill Courtney. I wonder whatever happened to him. It does. Like the it, same it, way it, people, like, you can probably Google time. whatever happened to Chavis Daniels, whatever happened to Money, right? Like any of those. But for you, for sure, with that movie, I've got to imagine people are like, where is Bill Courtney now? It's probably, I bet it would be the number one Google search. Where is Bill I, Courtney now? I, I, get like, it. I get it all the time. All the time. And what has been the most surprising one? The most surprising. Because I remember when it first came out, you were me. doing all those like Pete Carroll and yeah. like you befriended and all kinds of coaches and business yeah, owners. Yeah, and yeah. Whatever. And I mean, I, I still will tell you Serena Williams is my favorite of all of them. No. Oh, my gosh. My wife, if Lisa listens, Wait. she's going to be so pissed. Serena Williams drinks Jack and Coke like you do bottled water. 
And she <laughs> and my wife, you know, Serena Williams is grown. My wife is a little five foot six, hundred and fifteen pound petite thing, and she was sitting at a house and at this party. <laughs> And Lisa's just trying to match her. How are you at a party with Serena Williams? I just, I don't <laughs> what know, is going man. on? Hold on. I don't know. What is going on? I don't know. So anyway, what party okay. can you possibly be? So at? I go is off Serena and I do Williams? something. I come back and Lisa's over there, like you could pour her out of her seat, and she's hanging on Serena's bicep, going, "Your muscles are so big." <laughs> <laughs> And not 15 minutes later, she had Tim Tebow backed up at a corner saying, you stay a good boy. You don't let all this stuff go to your head. Had literally Tim Tebow backed in a corner. Oh, Same party. Sounds like Absolutely a- hilarious. And w- Serena Williams came up to you and said, I've seen the movie? No, she held a uh, screening for me. What? She held a screening. Where? In L.A. That's where Lisa and I were that night. Serena Williams is the one that put on the screening? Yeah, uh, that one. That's crazy. yeah. There's lots of stories, man. But I don't. I look, man. I don't want people to oh, hear come this. On, give me one more name drop. I don't. Another one. I don't that was take like myself a, that seriously, I know, dude. But I don't. Do I mean, you're a normal guy, so these are like the crazy stories and okay. So we're walking out of a park. <laughs> we're. I, I can't. I, I'll just use abbreviations. We're walking out of a party, and. Lisa's had a couple of glasses. My wife is far cooler than me, all right? <laughs> First of all, I'm a fat, redheaded, dumpy dude, right? Right. She's 50 years old and still has 30-year-olds hit on her all the time. She is a straight dime. She is. I yep. swear to God, my wife is hot, She and she's not blind, and which is <laughs> shocking, but, but that's the truth. But she's also fun, and she's got a hilarious sense of humor, and she also does not give a rat's ass about any of this. We can take it or leave. we got our business in Memphis. We're sure. Memphians. If people want to cancel me, cancel me. I'll go to the house, right? So <laughs> we're at this party. Lisa's had a couple glasses of wine, and now this is too late. Lisa's not a lush or a drunk. She's just two different times she had to be drinking. And as we're walking out is uh, um, uh, Steve Martin. Come on. Um, uh who is the guy on um, who sharded? Um, the guy on when po- the along came Polly, uh, Ben Stiller. It's Ben Stiller, Steve Martin, Martin Short, and one other comedian uh, standing there, and we just pass by, and I nod, and they nod, and they're talking, and Lisa stops and grabs Ben Stiller's cheek <laughs> and grabs it like a. <laughs> Does one of these? It says, "My goodness, you are so cute!" And it just keeps walking. I mean, Ben Stiller's like five seven, just a little guy, right? And <laughs> just walks out. And Steve Martin goes, "Hmm." And Ben Stiller goes, "Who the f is that?" <laughs> They're like, "This hot chick just pinched my cheek, and I want to know more, but..." I've never seen her around oh here. Well, here's why you hadn't. She's from Memphis. You're she ain't from even, around here. We don't belong. Yeah, I mean, dude, there's so many of those stories. Then there's you, there's something else in the works right now that I can't share with you yet, but you'll have me back on when it happens and you'll love it. Another movie? I don't know. We're updating it? Undefeated too? <laughs> no, <laughs> something else. But right now, y'all, here's the deal. And all, I want to tell you one last thing. All right. um, I'm not taking one dollar from an army of normal folks. No. Okay, I will. It is give it one, to me. Give it to me. <laughs> it is one. It is 100 um, percent a nonprofit philanthropic endeavor. Really? Yeah. You're not so, making any money off of this. Not one dime. Wow. So I, I say that. So, so when, when you, you found out it was number 10 on the Apple Well, I mean, chart, look. Did, the, you, did you reconsider if the, if your the position? Thing, if the thing, yeah, look. If the and thing they told goes you they got to do 52 of them. Get some <laughs> big thing. Maybe I'll, but I'm not. Maybe I'll consider my position. I'm not. But I will say this. Yeah. But <laughs> I will say this. Like this the reason I'm saying it is <laughs> this is not a personal plug. But I'm begging people to go listen to it. Download it, subscribe to it, so it shows up on your on your library. Listen to it, 
because the more you hear it, the more you're going to like it. Share it with your friends. Share it on social. Help me get the word out there because the higher up it goes up the charts and the more people that listen, the more chance we actually have to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm asking for that from your audience, I'm asking not for my personal gain. That's right. the reason I'm telling you. Now, if the thing goes huge <laughs> and there's a bunch of things, I'm not saying I wouldn't. <laughs> we got to renegotiate. <laughs> just in case. But right now I'm not taking you know, like full disclosure. I didn't know this thing was going to be a big deal. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. No, I mean, we didn't think Undefeated was going to be a big... <laughs> Two dudes showed up in oh. skinny-legged pants wearing a scarf. Who does that in Memphis? Bro, I told you, I, 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 right before you came on, that movie's like the bane of my existence. So, like, if the end, it'll say, like, I'm in the credits as, like, uh, contributions or whatever, because I befriended all the directors when they're there. And so at that time, I was on the radio. They gave me a whole script to read uh, as if, you know, we're talking about Manassas and talking about what's going on with the school and whatever else. And I just drug my feet forever. I finally sent it to them, and they're like, yeah, we've already edited. And I was like, okay, whatever. All right, whatever. And then the damn thing with the Oscar, <laughs> and I was like, are you well, kidding what me? What I do? Are you kidding me? <laughs> what? What? I know. This is... I just thought they are 20-something-year-old guys. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll help All right, movie. Well, those were the guys. I know. Well, okay, so those guys show up and say, hey, we want to film you and make a movie. And I you're know. like... All right, right, whatever. And then they leave Memphis and they say, we're going to make our movie. And I'm like, if this thing, maybe Channel 422 Crazy. on Wednesday at 2 in the morning. Maybe. And a year later, Lisa and I are walking down the red carpet with P. Diddy. What? <laughs> Who does that? How's that happen? Every, and trust me, every it's single a, person. I, I stepped on George Clooney's foot. <laughs> I mean, the man just mashed his foot. He's also, he's, he's adorable. He's a cute little thing. Clean, he's little too. Nice, no, precious. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest with you. The people who ought to really, I mean, I've been around all these people now, and the people who really deserve the awards are the hair and makeup people. Because <laughs> a lot of these folks you think are, uh, you see on the magazines yeah, and all that. They got Instagram you think, wow, filters that, on, huh? Boy, they're hot. I'm telling you, most. Mm, not really. The hair and makeup people. I do actually had. Really. You remember that night we went out with my buddy Kevin Frazier from. Uh, he he was a guy. Yeah. He's on Entertainment Tonight, and he was out with us one night after a game, and uh, he was like, "I'm telling you, he's like, you could take. We're at the Flying Saucer. He was like, there's 20 girls in here that if I put them in hair and makeup, that they would look like. I mean." You th uh, Jennifer Aniston, whoever you yeah, want to name, that, right? Like that they, I, I've that been they up, are yeah. up, unbelievable. Up close and personal with most of these people and around them. And they're great people. They're normal people. They, they, you know, if they're not doing their shtick and stuff. But the truth is, you're like, well, that's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, that's disappointing. But I'm going to tell you, you something. Did, you had no hair and makeup oh, for yeah, your I mean, movie. It's like, you know, You're like, hey, moles I am who I am. Maybe you should wax that or something. That's I mean, but George Clooney, that some bitch is fine. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't need... He's, I, I, he, no, I, he's I, the I truth. I totally believe it. Oh, he is. I'm he's a telling handsome you. dude. Oh, he's precious. Yeah. He is. He's about 5'6". I want to pat him is on. Is that little. right? Uh, he's five six. Five, Brian four. Harvey, really? he could have won the British Open yeah, yesterday. Yeah, I mean nothing wrong. I'm just saying you see dude. him on. Yeah, no, I mean you know I who am he, I talking? I'm he a never fat, struck ugly, redheaded dude. Little dude. What? Are you sure he's that little? They're all short. Five, most I, of them are short. Most Hollywood actors like are short. No, he's like five eight, five wow. nine. I mean, he's not a big guy. Yeah, but you think of him as well, a I mean, larger than yeah, life personality. You think of him as larger than life guy. And then you see him in person, you're like, what? But the truth is, he doesn't need hair and makeup. He carries all that <laughs> straight. Yeah, I think he was, he was named the sexiest man alive at one point. So He's hot. I mean, I'd like to have him on a special Supporting Greatness episode. Just about being hot? I think I think he'd melt me. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I could do that. It's audio. Him. Yeah, just so. Oh. Just don't do it in person. George, you're so attractive. George, you're so attractive. All right, well, the name of the podcast is An Army of Normal Folks. Go search it. It's available on all podcast outlets. Bill Courtney, I'm so happy for you. I'm glad things are going well with the pod. Thanks, and we're going to have to keep up to date on this for sure. Let's and do it. whenever this new project drops, let us know. All right, I will. And um, as always, thanks for plugging me and having me. Yeah.